Thank you, David, and hello, everyone. Um, it might take a second for the slides to, uh, to, oh, there they are, great. So my name is Neha, um, and as David said, I just finished my PhD at MIT about two months ago, um, and I'm here to talk to you guys about an idea that I've been thinking about lately. It kind of came out of the work of my PhD. Just FYI, this has nothing to do with Mesos, so I hope it's a welcome reprieve from the, the rest of the conference. But it's the idea of trading simplicity for performance when we are designing and running our distributed systems. So a little bit about my background. Uh, like David said, I worked at Google, and I worked on developing a storage, uh, blob storage service that was run across Google for use with lots of applications, storing Gmail attachments, uh, videos, things of that nature. We wrote the first version of it, but this was a long time ago. I finished, just finished my PhD from MIT, and the research that I did there was working on fast transactions for multi-core databases and distributed systems. So I'm really interested in transactions and how we can get high performance and strong consistency. So let me tell you a little bit about this talk. So first of all, um, I've spent the past seven years of my life in academia. Before that, I did work at an actual company, and I did launch and run systems, but I don't think I really remember very much that's useful from seven years ago. The world has changed so much. So I'm not going to be able to talk about experiences running Mesos or running other systems. Um, instead, this talk is going to be more about ways of thinking and about ideas. So the first thing I want to cover is what we really mean when we talk about whether or not our system is simple or complex. What, what does that mean? What are we concerned about? What's interesting there? The next thing I want to discuss is a little bit about how to think about performance, because oftentimes it's not as intuitive as we actually think it is. It's ju not just about making things go faster. Um, I also want to talk about the challenges that arise with the usual ways of getting performance. It's not always a good idea to try to get more performance out of your system. And I also want to sort of talk about some trends that we see in hardware and in research um, that might indicate what's coming in the future. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about complexity. So this word has a lot of different meanings. It's very overloaded. Oftentimes, we refer to complexity as in computational complexity theory. And what that means is how long it takes to uh, run a program to solve a problem. Then there's information theory. So this idea is the number of bits required to describe an entity or the, the length of a string it takes to sort of uh, identify something. And then there are these last two things, programming complexity, software complexity, and this idea of complex adaptive systems. And I want to talk about these two types of complexity, the complexity that arises in our software when we, um, when we try to implement software systems, and the complexity that arises from systems that have a lot of components that end up showing behavior that's often non-intuitive and totally unexpected. OK, so let's start. Things are simple or things are complex. And let's say that there's a spectrum in between. So when we think about computing, one of the simplest forms of computing that I know of is the abacus. An abacus is very simple. It can do a lot of things uh, with numbers, but you know it's got these simple parts. It can be operated by a human. It's fairly straightforward how this thing works. Now, a big leap from an abacus is a computer, okay? a single computer. So here we've got a lot more state. We have a processor. We have caches. We have disk. We have a ton more going on. And as such, we can do a lot more types of computation on a computer. This really opens up our world. Now what we're moving into is we have things like data centers that have a lot of computers. And when we start to string computers together, a whole new set of challenges starts to arise. We have to deal with uh, not only a lot of these systems which are working differently, we have to figure out how to communicate between these systems, and we have to deal with the fact that our failure model has changed. Now things can fail arbitrarily, uh, and that can be difficult to figure out. And as we extend these distributed systems uh, across the world, we run into even more problems. Uh, the, the simple speed of light problem, where things that are very far apart take a long time to communicate. And I think what's really cool is that you know, these, these problems, these challenges, are only going to get worse. So this is a picture of New Horizons, the probe. Um, that was launched about nine years ago to explore the outer reaches of our solar system. And just really quick, do you guys know what happened in July with New Horizons? 
Yes, no? So, so uh, basically, very recently, New Horizons went by Pluto and showed us these amazing pictures of Pluto. Uh, it was really cool. You might have seen the heart-shaped pictures in all of the news stories. But before that, around July 4th, actually, New Horizons hit a glitch. And what happened was that uh, two things that weren't supposed to happen at the same time happened at the same time. One was like plotting some kind of trajectory and the other was compressing images. Um, and the processor overloaded, which caused the computer on New Horizons to reboot into safe mode. And so you've got this, um, this probe that is heading towards Pluto. It's a nine hour round trip time and a very, very low bandwidth in order to send messages to this probe. And NASA engineers had to figure out how to get this probe back online in order to take pictures of Pluto, which they did. It took a few days, but they totally did. And I just think that this is a really amazing, like imagine trying to, you know, you think you have problems when like you're SSHing into your machine in California and you're in Europe. Oh God, the latency, right? Like these guys have to deal with a nine hour round trip time. But it's really amazing and it kind, of, it kind of indicates like the types of problems that we have to deal with in our systems. It's just, I think it's so cool. So the problem with a complex system is that more complexity inevitably means more moving parts and more ways for things to interact, which means more corner cases, more strange situations for our systems and our machines to get into. And the problem with that is that when things don't happen frequently, it means that we don't understand them. So things that are rare, that don't happen very often, such as rare bugs or one request out of every thousand being extremely slow or failing, are very difficult to debug and understand because we just don't have enough data there to understand what's going on. And the result of that is that complex systems are harder to comprehend, to predict, to debug, and to change. So the benefits of the simple system, in contrast, are, is that it's much, much easier to understand and maintain. We feel a lot more confident when we have the characteristics of a system in our heads and we're able to sort of predict how it's going to act according to the changes we're making. And that means that there'll be fewer bugs and fewer sleepless nights. So it seems like simplicity overall is an amazing thing to strive for. We should absolutely build simple systems. But if we take the example we had before, the abacus and cluster computing, and we think about what we can actually do with these things, the abacus um, is very good at dealing with numbers. We can add, subtract, multiply, divide. The cluster computing system, however, gives us services like Google, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, it allows us to have instant communication between these devices in our pockets located all over the world. Um, eventually, it's gonna give us self-driving cars. All the world's knowledge is already at our fingertips. And as with New Horizons, it's giving us the ability to understand the origins of our universe. So yes, a cluster computing environment, a geo-replicated um, environment is incredibly complex, but there's, it obviously enables a lot more for us to do. So clearly we should strive for simplicity, but complexity is necessary in our systems. And the challenge here is really figuring out how much of it is necessary. And once we have very complex distributed systems, how do we deal with them? So here is an example of what an application might look like. Several different layers going on here. There's a storage layer and oftentimes these applications have multiple different systems that they're using for storage. There's one type of database, there's a MongoDB, there's a Redis, there's all sorts of things going on. Uh, almost every single high performance I've app application I've seen has had some sort of in-memory caching layer. There's several different application servers and with the types of clients we have today, we have to do things like push notifications and events. We have to do batch processing in order to get business intelligence on what we're doing and we have to take the results of that and update our data. And so the systems that we're building are actually quite complicated right now. They have a lot of moving parts and they have a lot of pieces. So let's take a closer look at the causes for this complexity. And I'm being incredibly general here. I'm sort of bucketing things into very broad categories. Um, but so one of them is application features. So it would be great if we could stop once we've deployed a system to production and we're running it and we're serving users, it would be amazing if we could just stop shipping new code, right? Then the system would, would probably not break nearly as often. However, that also means that your company would stop making any money, I'm guessing. And so unfortunately, application features um, and pushing new code, it's a necessary evil. 
Similarly, process can often cause complexity in our systems. So by process, what I mean is code reviews. The fact that the engineer who wrote the code that's running on your servers might not be at your company today, and you have to deal with that. The fact that business priorities change, and so you might push services that turn out not to be necessary later on or need to be repurposed. Another necessary evil. Then there's security, which I think is, is pretty different than application features in the sense that your customers might not realize um, how much they are actually care about it, but it's still something that's really important and that you have to think about and that can cause a lot of complexity in your system. But the three that I want to focus on are um, availability, correct data, and performance, because these three things, achieving these three things, actually cause a lot of complexity in the systems that we're trying to create. I actually think that they're the root of a lot of complexity in our data systems. Um, and I want to talk about how to deal with that and how to address it. So first of all, let's talk about performance, about achieving high performance in our systems. So first we have to have some idea of what it means to have good performance. So usually when we talk about performance, we're talking about throughput and we're talking about latency. So throughput means how many requests can we get out of this resource at the same time? And latency is how long does a request take? But even that isn't quite enough. Those two things are very related, but they often have different performance characteristics. Even with latency, what type of latency do we care about? Do we care about our average latency? Do we care about the 90th percentile? Do we care about the maximum latency that any request might see? And so, as an example, here is a graph. It's a latency probability distribution. And what that means is that on the x-axis, I have time. Uh, and this is a log scale, so it would look even more warped if it wasn't a log scale, ranging from zero to 1,000 seconds. And on the y-axis, I have percentages. And um, a point here means that uh, at that point in time, that many percentages of requests completed in that amount of time or less. So let's take a look at the 50% mark. So this is the median latency, right? And so in this data that I actually just totally made up, but could potentially represent a real system, what we see here is that the median latency is somewhere between uh, 100 microseconds and a millisecond. Great, that sounds really, really good. That sounds pretty fast. I think that's a reasonably performing system. But then as we start to, start to look at the 90th percentile latency and the 99th percentile latency, it tells a different story. We've gotten uh, up closer to a second. So that means that 1% of requests are taking more than a second. Does that matter? That's a really good question. And then we take a look at the maximum. And in this particular graph that I've drawn, it's 1,000 seconds. So the maximum request, the, the highest latency request in your system is taking 1,000 seconds. Maybe that doesn't matter, but maybe it really, really does. And the reason that I think tail latency is so interesting is because scale amplifies tail latency problems. So when you're running at scale, when you have more machines, it means that you're inevitably going to have more variability in the performance of those machines. And more variability means worse tail latency. And this can get even worse if you're running the type of ap application that needs to talk to many servers in order to complete a request. Because if, if you have to talk to a lot of servers before you can complete a request, that means that you're at the mercy of the slowest server. You can't return until you get the data from the slowest server. So your latency is going to end up looking like the weakest link in your system, like the slowest server, which is very interesting to me. And it, it's an example of how sort of properties emerge from complex systems that we don't necessarily predict. So another problem when we're thinking about performance and latency is that oftentimes trying to improve average performance can make tail latency much worse. And as I just pointed out, lots of times you really do care about tail latency because it's what's limiting the performance of your system. So two examples of this are index structures and memory managed systems. So let's think about indexes. So you build it, like the naive way to store data in a database is in a flat file or in a log. You just sort of are doing writes, you do the writes to the log, to the tail end of the log, append them, and if you want to read something, you kind of digest the log and figure out what the answer is. Now, this is terrible for read performance, which compromises most of the workload we're doing a lot of the time. And so we have index structures, like B trees. And indexes are great. They make reads very, very fast. Um, in a hash table, they're O of 1. In a, in a tree, they're um, log n. This is wonderful. However, index structures make writes slower. 
And when we're using trees, like red-black trees, they can actually cause situations where the tree needs to be rebalanced. And so even though you've made uh, the average request, the reads, a lot faster, you've caused these strange problems to happen when a, re a request comes in that causes the tree to need to be rebalanced. You've made the tail worse. A similar thing happens in memory managed systems um, where we use garbage collection. Garbage collection often causes huge problems. I've heard stories uh, from my friends who work at Twitter about how uh, they manage garbage collection very, very, very carefully. I don't know if this is still the case, but um, they might actually monitor the statistics of a machine and when it looks like garbage collection is about to happen, they stop sending requests to that machine let the garbage collection happen, and then resume. Because if they didn't, those requests would all be affected and tail latency would be affected. So let's talk about some techniques that we often use for better performance, and then uh, a few gotchas that I've seen with these techniques, a few of the challenges for implementing these techniques at scale. So uh, again, I'm being a little bit general here, but almost when it comes down to it, almost all the ways I've seen for improving performance in your data store come down to these three things, uh, aside from just making your code run faster, getting a faster processor. So the first one is replicating data on disk into memory for faster retrieval, so also commonly known as caching. Another technique is keeping replicas, keeping multiple copies of the data that you need to retrieve or write, and then choosing amongst the replicas to try to get the faster ones. And so this is another way of, uh, of getting higher performance because you're kind of reducing the variability in your system. And then another really common way is partitioning. And what this means is you are trying to distribute the load amongst multiple servers. You're trying to use multiple CPUs and multiple servers memory. And you can partition for reads, which really means that you're just replicating your data and you're sending requests to different servers for reads. You're trying to spread out the read load amongst servers. Or you can partition for writes, which is really the only way to get better performance if you have a high write load, is divide your data up amongst machines so you can send a subset of that workload to each machine. So different challenges arise when you're using these different, different techniques. And so these are some of the ones that arise with caching. I have almost, like I said before, almost every single high performance uh, system I've seen uh, has uses a cache, uses some kind of in-memory cache in front of their database. And this seems like a great idea, but it actually introduces so many sources of complexity. There's the issue of keeping the cache up to date. Uh, so, for instance, knowing which keys to invalidate or update if you actually care about your cache being consistent with your database. There's the problem of ordering updates. So if, you're, if you have multiple writes going to the database, how do you ensure that the right one wins when it gets to the cache? And then there's an issue, the thundering herd problem. Uh, so there's, at the bottom of the slide, I have this link to a paper by Facebook, which goes into a lot of these um, problems in great detail, because Facebook is such a huge user of caching. And the thundering herd problem is when um, something in the cache becomes invalidated, and many clients see it at one time, and they all go to the database at the same time to recompute this invalid value. And the database becomes incredibly overloaded because it has to deal with all this traffic that it wasn't provisioned to handle. And most of that work is totally unnecessary. You only need to recompute the value once and stick it in the cache. So maybe we can have a client just compute, you know, one client compute it and put it in the cache, but clients can fail. And so it's a challenging situation, and there's some details in the paper about how to handle it. Another problem is that once you add caching, you've, you've made your system more complex because now you have to think about provisioning. Your database is no longer provisioned to handle the entire load of your system. And so if you need to cold start a new data center or if a cache happens to go down, you can end up taking down your entire system for what was supposed to be an, op an optimization. So similar challenges arise with replication. Uh, so with replication, a very classic problem is consistency. So if you want to keep replicas consistent, there are two primary techniques. One is primary backup. So there's an idea in, in MySQL replication, it's master-slave. Uh, or you can use consensus, in which there isn't one single primary who's a source of truth, but instead you're using a lot of different servers to determine uh, what each replica should have. Now, another it's, it's very challenging to implement both of these correctly. So um, there's a really cool paper about doing primary backup correctly, and, and there's a lot of challenges to get it to perform well. It's not trivial. 
Um, another, another problem is implementing a failover process. So perhaps you have replicas, so you're all set for fault tolerance. In case a machine goes down, you can fail over to another one. But what is that process? How does it happen? I've heard a lot of interesting stories from friends where the biggest headache they had to deal with when running their application was when they had to fail over to the backup and something went wrong. Another issue which is quite interesting is anticipating correlated failures. So a lot of times uh, clients might be issuing a lot of requests to the primary. The primary has some problems, so the clients say, okay, the primary is having issues, now we're all gonna switch over to the backup. Of course, it might have been the clients causing the issue to begin with, in which case you've just taken down your entire system. So these are correlated failures. Uh, there are interesting techniques to deal with that. In the paper at the bottom of the slide, one thing they talk about are canary requests. So can you, when you're running something at a really high scale and you're worried about things like that request of death or that query of death that's gonna end up taking down machines, instead of sending it to all machines at once, you can send out these sort of like canaries to test these requests and see if they're, see if they're actually okay. Another big problem, as I talked about before, is the variability between replicas. So uh, keeping replicas in sync, again, you're at the mercy of the slowest replica in your system, the straggler. So, okay, partitioning is another common way of getting better performance in your system. So distributing your load amongst multiple machines, also insanely challenging, also introduces so many sources of complexity in your system. Once you've decided to partition, you're moving from one server to many servers. Are your clients ready for that? Do you know what a good partitioning is? Sometimes that's really obvious. There's a primary key, you partition your data by primary key, and you're done. But in graph uh, data sets or in social networks, oftentimes there is no good primary key. Or in other words, no matter what primary key you choose, you're gonna end up having to do a lot of cross-partition requests. Now the problem with cross-partition requests is that when you have to talk to many machines, you're no longer getting the speed up you wanted to get by partitioning in the first place. Instead of sending one query to one machine, you're now sending n queries to n machines. Uh, I've also heard stories about repartitioning problems. This can often be a huge headache. When I was at Google, uh, occasionally they had to repartition the ads database, which at that point was run on many different MySQL servers. And that was a multi-month, many-man week endeavor. There was a lot of work involved in trying to take the ads database from whatever number of partitions it had to the next set. And it was, it was just a huge ordeal that, that slowed down a lot of really good work. And then finally, when you do move to a partitioned um, database or partitioned um, key value store, you lose a lot of what you used to have with ORMs and with SQL, and now you have to end up um, dealing with this in the application. So given that getting high performance is so hard, uh, given that there are all these challenges, all these gotchas with the very basic ways of getting um, better performance, it seems like it might be a good idea to just deal. And I think this is actually a very valid way to handle your system is to, is to, is to sort of accept fate. So um, the, the places where this works are when you don't care if data is necessarily 100% correct or if the site goes down every so often. So my understanding, Amazon's uh, AWS SLA is 99.95% .95 uptime. And so that translates to about five hours a year of downtime. Five hours a year is not crazy. I mean, it depends on what you're running, right? But, but it's important to think about these things and think about whether it's worth uh, having this sort of like geo-replicated master-master uh, system for five hours a year of downtime. Uh, another thing is that your system might be fast enough um, or you're able to pay for a faster machine. And if that's the case, it might not make sense to, to add on all the headaches that moving to multiple replicas or multiple servers is going to bring you. And the reason why this occasionally is a good idea is it because it frees up resources. It means you no longer have to worry about all the challenges that I just laid out. Instead, you can spend your time working on application features. Now, quite obviously, the problem with this is that it ends up pushing complexity up a layer. 
And this is something I see a lot with a lot of systems that we're building today, is that the system seems really simple and easy to use and really cool. It's like, okay, great, we just have this key value store. It's very easy, um, we put data in, we get data out. There aren't any complicated protocols behind it, but that ends up translating into a much more complex application. For example, because the key value store doesn't support SQL. Uh, Another example is if you have a very simple system that goes down a lot of the times, this can push complexity up into your operations layer. So now you've got to worry about communicating with customers and dealing with your board and issuing refunds in case the system does go down. So the point I want to make here is that we need to think about where complexity is in our systems, in particular which layer we're sort of admitting the complexity and dealing with it. Okay, so here are some sort of random ideas and things about how to deal with complexity, how to manage it. So if you don't wanna just ignore it, if you wanna actually build a system that, um, that, that can account for performance and fault tolerance and correct data, then here are some, some ideas about how to do that. So first of all, we need to think about the design and implementation of our system. Now, this is a little bit controversial because I know everyone likes to plan for the best case. Everyone likes to plan for raging success. Um, but the simple fact of the matter is that you're not gonna get to raging success if you're spending all of your time fighting fires with your systems. So it really makes sense in the beginning to design for the medium term, I think. And what that means is no over-optimizing. So no optimizing without back-of-the-envelope calculations and experimental proof. You think you're gonna need 100 machines. Do you really need 100 machines? What kind of workload are you actually doing? Does that make sense? And when you do this, you need to plan on a redesign. It's inevitable that you will need to redesign your data store. And so what kind of abstraction layers can you put in place so that's gonna be easier? Another thing to do is to exploit application tolerance for slowness, failure, and stale results. And I haven't really seen a lot of this. I haven't really seen people who look at all parts of their system and say, what needs to be fast? What is okay being slow? Where is it okay to see stale results? Where is it not okay to see stale results? And where can I tolerate the system being down for hours, for days, for weeks, for months? And I think this is really, really important. And it's not to say it's because you're going to use very highly specialized systems for all these different parts of your application, but just so that you know what's actually going on and you know what kinds of semantics you need for the different layers. Another thing that's really useful to do is when you're building your systems, have a plan to degrade instead of failing and retrying. So I talked about how with replication, often there's this really big problem where you might have correlated failures. Well, if you can build your system so that when there's failure in your system, you can handle it instead of just throwing up your hands or trying to go to the replica, this can often make for a much better experience and make for your application is still up while you're trying to debug. And then finally, randomize to decorrelate. Uh, it, it's often the situation that timeouts are set to be the same thing across all clients. And I've seen a lot of situations where in distributed systems, many different servers can end up operating in lockstep, which can, can cause all sorts of problems. And so randomization is a really easy way to ensure that your servers don't end up uh, correlated. Now, aside from thinking about these issues when you're working on designing your system, uh, there's also testing. So enumerate all the corner cases. Since this is a very complex system and it has a lot of moving parts, there are more corner cases. Um, the best thing you can do is test them ahead of time. And test for potential human error. Imagine as if the person who is restoring your backup accidentally points your VIP at the wrong machine. What happens? Does anyone get notified? Imagine that a person accidentally restarts the wrong server or pushes the wrong config. Uh, have sort of these ideas of ways that humans can do wrong things and try to test or account for them. Test client error handling paths. Lots of times these very um, uncommon error, error handling paths are untested. And simulate misbehaving clients. So there's some really interesting stories about this, about how if you're running a service, clients can end up being your worst enemy. They can end up DOSing the service. So don't trust your clients just because they're within your company. Okay. So we talked about a little bit about how things are now, um, but one thing I wanted to get at is where things are going and what's the future. 
So there's a lot of new hardware designs kind of coming down the line and moving into data centers. And I think they're really interesting because I think they're gonna mean that we end up with really different kinds of systems in our data centers. So the first trend is one that people have been calling a trend for a very long time, but that's cheap memory. And what I mean by that is that it becomes, it becomes feasible to no longer think about going to disk, to no longer think about the latency and the seek time involved for going to disk. Uh, we can start to design systems and data stores that achieve durability just thinking about using memory. Another hardware trend is higher by section bandwidth in data centers. We're moving away from this tree topology and we're getting to the case where we actually have quite a bit of bandwidth in our data centers. And when we combine that with lower per messaging network overheads, what that means is that all of a sudden, a sudden sending messages within a data center becomes very cheap. It becomes very cheap to send messages. It's very low overhead. Uh, with, with technologies like RDMA, you don't have to invoke the kernel in order to read data from another machine. And so this, this creates a different world where sending a message in RPC or a request is no longer such a high overhead event. And then the last trend that, that I wanted to point out is IO hardware virtualization. So this is interesting because a lot of the tasks that the operating system had to do, like isolation, and naming is now moving into hardware. And so what that means is that we don't need as much from the operating system as what we used to. And so what these trends together sort of end up meaning is, is um, we've got this data center operating system that can bypass the kernel for a lot of different events. And so you've got this much tighter coupling between the application and the hardware. And as such, you have really high performance within the data center. And so uh, at conferences last year, um, a lot of the papers were about these very high performance data center operating systems. Um, there's also been a lot of work in really high performance key value systems, since that's a lot of what's being run in these contexts. And at a conference coming up this year, a systems conference, five of the papers are about high performance distributed transactions uh, systems. And it's really interesting because they have very, they have names like um, high performance ACID and implementing linearizability at large scale and low latency. And then finally, no compromises, distributed transactions with consistency, availability, and performance. So really what researchers are working on right now is showing that within a data center, we can have this very fast, high performance, strongly consistent layer. Now the real question is what does this mean for the real world, for operations? And I can't really answer that, I, d I don't really know. Um, given that we might one day have this layer that looks a lot more like you're programming one machine in the data center instead of programming thousands of machines, what kind of tools are we gonna need to manage that? Do containers still make sense? Um, does, what does the operating system look like? What, are the, what kind of scheduling tools do we need? What kind of failure models do we need to think about? And so I think that's the really interesting question coming up is as these systems start to make it out into the real world, what sorts of issues will practitioners actually run into? So to kind of wind up, I wanted to, I wanted to, to leave like one, one last sort of bit of advice. And in my opinion, I think it's, it's a good idea to push complexity down instead of pushing complexity up. So I think the underlying system that we're dealing with, the data center operating system, your storage systems, should be complex but well tested in order to make layers further up the stack simpler. So I believe they should provide things like strong consistency. I believe that they should, they should take all the optimizations they need to take for performance um, in order to make applications easier to write and easier to build. I think that in 10 or 15 years, uh, people who want to launch a mobile app or who want to write a website are not going to need to know of, about how to spin up servers on EC2, hopefully. They won't need to know about databases or caching layers or failure models because I, I really hope that we will have built the systems for them so that they don't have to worry about these things and they can focus on their domains and doing the things that they do best. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much for letting me come talk to you about my ideas and I'm happy to take questions. Go ahead. Uh, to avoid, co okay. 
coherence? Correlation. Okay, so the question was, can you give some examples of randomization to avoid correlation? So, um, okay, that's a great question. So, uh, definitely client timeouts. So, if all clients issue requests to the database and have the same timeout of, say, one second, then w and a database gets overloaded, then what's going to end up happening is these clients are all sort of going to end up in lockstep. They're going to issue all these requests to the database. They're all going to fail. They're all going to reissue their requests to the database at the same time. That database is never going to come back up again because it's being overloaded by retries. Um, another place where I personally have seen randomization uh, be effective is when um, you're designing a, a consensus-based system and you want to be able to have multiple proposers in that system, but you don't want them to get stuck in a place where they're constantly canceling each other out. And so what you do is you use randomization, that if you fail, you wait a while before you retry because someone else might have snuck in there and done what you were trying to do. So I don't know if that makes sense entirely, but I'm happy to talk about it more afterwards in more detail. Okay, so the question was about data delivery in terms of exactly once, or at least once, at most once. Um, so this is something I haven't thought about a lot, but I do know that there, there is a lot of work about making stronger assumptions about what the network does, again, especially within a data center. Um, and so I've read papers about building consensus protocols where you can assume delivery eventual delivery, or you can assume delivery in some sort of order. And these types of assumptions actually do make it much easier to write high performance protocols. So, um, so, so I think it's a great thing. And I, I think we're actually quite close to being able to ensure it in the data center, except in like very, very, very uh, uncommon cases. So things like exactly once and at most once are, are the types of assumptions that make it a lot easier to think about what's happening in your system. So I, I think it's a great idea. Uh, one more, time for one more question. There's one. Oh, okay. Did, did someone raise their hand? Oh, okay, whoever did, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so I had a little bit of trouble hearing you, but I think what you were, you were talking about is this idea of pushing complexity down is actually quite dangerous because it's, it kind of is, violates the end-to-end -end principle, in, which is defined in networking. And that is a really good point, actually. And I, I think, so this is just my opinion, but I, I think it's actually somewhat cyclic. So I think we start with something that's like the end-to-end -end principle, and we start with really simple and understandable stuff in the middle of our network, and then we see what applications build, and we see the tools that they need, and we realize that we actually do need to incorporate more complexity internally um, to the application, to the, to the network or to the system. And the reason that I think we need to do that is because I see a lot of applications that end up re-implementing the same types of things over and over and over again. They re-implement fault tolerance. They re-implement uh, SQL queries on a key value store. They re-implement consensus. And these are, once we realize that these are tools that everyone needs to use, we should, we should not expect every single application developer to write them themselves. Instead, we should build really um, usable, uh, very, very well-designed and well-tested systems that people can use, that they can plug and play. So I don't think it necessarily violates the end-to-end -end principle, though I think there's some room for flexibility there. All right, thank you so much. Yeah.